I'm going to um, just speak to you briefly about radiofrequency ablation. Um, I expect that everybody here has had some exposure to this already. Um, you'll notice that according to whatever attending or training experience you have, there may be some variation in um, the approaches, uh, meaning the like um, the um, fluoroscopic views that are utilized, or some difference in the sequence of the fluoroscopic views. Um, I'll talk to you about um, what my um, uh, what my technique is, which is really taken straight from the uh, SIS or Spine Intervention Society um, recommendations. So if we look at um, the cervical spine um, to begin with, the facet joints, of, of course, are here posterior laterally oriented. And um, the medial branches are going to be wrapping around from the side of the joints. Um, so in order to um, ideally approach these when we are doing a radio frequency procedure, um, the recommendation is to have a slight obliquity um, in your initial needle approach. So that would be um, uh, an obliquity in the range of five to 10 degrees from a true PA. So you're gonna start when you do, when we have the cervical model on the table, what you'll see is that I'll start with an AP position or PA position, and then I will obliquify, or excuse me, I will caudally or cranially tilt the C arm so that I, um, so that I can see um, the scalloped edge of the, um, of the facet joints optimally from the side. Then I'll have my um, x-ray technologist obliquify um, the a fluoroscopic image by five to 10 degrees. Um, and that's where I will initially enter with my needle in a tunnel view, um, a, a tunnel, like a gun barrel view approach um, to the side of the lateral mass with a, with a slight obliquity. And the idea is to place your needle um, just very, um, uh, very slightly around the corner of the groove or this kind of like the waist here of the, uh, of, the, of the lateral mass where the cervical medial branch will be circling around. Once the needle is engaged in tissues that are substantive enough to hold it in some, with some um, security, uh, then I'm gonna rotate my C arm to a lateral view, which is honestly one of the harder views to optimize. Um, because you are negotiating, um, what you're trying to achieve is a view which um, uh, aligns the lamina on both the right and the left side, um, and also uh, gets the best um, view, the best orientation of the, um, the facet joint itself. So that is gonna require some communication about um, um, about wigwag and also obliquity to get that, that optimal view. Um, after the, um, in a lateral view, the needle will be advanced um, to just the dorsal um, neural foraminal aperture. Uh, and then um, I will go back to AP and I will confirm that in an AP view, um, I see that my needle is really um, hugging or laying closely against the lateral mass. Um, it would, um, it, typically I already know that because I feel um, the needle um, moving along that surface, but the um, AP view, we always want two views um, in, any, in any, any procedure that we're doing to allow um, a breadth of perspective uh, for safety and confirmation of what we believe we see. Um, in that view then, um, in that AP view confirming uh, the position against the side of the lateral mass, um, then I will um, start to do testing for the patient. I do sensory testing from C3 um, to the bottom of the cervical spine medial branches. I don't do cervical testing for the third occipital nerve. Um, I don't also always do motor testing um, in my practice. Um, that There's some variation and it'll be a good idea for you to talk to your different um, uh, instructors in those faculty here as well today to learn if that is their standard of care. Um, but that is an area of, of um, 
dispute in, in, in this uh, interventional space. So um, I use, um, in my practice, uh, the radio frequency um, generator that I use is a Boston Scientific's generator. Um, the, there, there are several on the, in the marketplace. Um, I can tell you that um, I've been really happy with this generator because like many of them, they have four ports um, so that you can do four ablations at a single time. Um, which means that you can ablate, if you're doing facet joints, three facet joints in one, in one um, setting. Um, one of the advantages that I, we've had other uh, generators as well in my practice, one of the advantages of this generator over others is that um, when you, uh, there are times when you are beginning or in the middle, amidst of a radio frequency lesion and it um, indicates that there is um, resistance and or um, that the and the lesion is aborted um, and uh, in if that's the case or impedance I should say and if that's the case um, with this particular generator it uh, earmarks or it times the amount of um, uh, the, the number of seconds that have been achieved at the temperature you've programmed um, before that generate that lead times out or discon um, discontinues so that when you do turn or adjust or reposition that needle and then go back to continue um, to that, that lesion, um, you can start from, you can pick up from the number of seconds that you've already completed um, toward the end of that lesion period, usually in the neighborhood of 85 to 90 seconds. Uh, other advantages of this particular uh, generator, definitely there's different, um, you'll be exposed to different systems, but um, the other thing that I like, I work in a practice of um, actually six or seven people who all use um, the machine, and this machine is able to individually save particular doctor's preferences. So if I'm going to be doing a, a a peripheral nerve, a clunial nerve uh, ablation, um, I, my, uh, my nurse or my uh, assistant in the room can just press a button that says Dr. Lee's preferences and it'll, everything that I, that I would characteristically se select is, is ready to go. Um, let's see here. I think that um, we are almost set up so we can um, turn the camera toward the uh, specimen. Okay, I think that'll be fine, yeah. All right. And we should, thank you to our team too. This is like a heroically fast turnover. Thank you. All right, so Steve, oh, not Steve today. John, thank you. Okay. All right, so, um, John, what I'd like you to do is uh, get an AP view of the cervical spine. Okay, so definitely this is pretty rotated. Let's try that again and see what we've got. Uh, could you go a little higher? Actually, the, the image is upside down. That's one of the things that's throwing me off. Um, and then lower it is, not higher, this direction. No problem. Okay, picture. Okay. Um, so could we center that, meaning moved, I think it's moving toward, yeah, thank you very much. So um, you can see, he, um, so there, there'll be some challenges with this specimen because of difficulties um, in getting a really, um, a patient in a neutral posture, um, but we will talk through what we can here. Um, so here, picture, picture. My needle is right above the dorsal process or the spinous process of C7. Um, let's, um, can you uh, oblique toward me to see if I can identify any of the other cervical spinous processes? Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. So I see seven stands out here um, that I'm not sure that I am going to be able to identify the others based on this sort of the rigidity and the positional challenges of this specimen. Picture, please. Picture, please. So um, picture, please. Picture, please. OK. So um, this is the side of the lateral mass that you can see. It is a little bit difficult to appreciate behind the, um, the mandible picture. Again. And there's the side of the lateral mass, probably of C5-6. We can uh, confirm the level when we rotate to a lateral position. So I don't, I think that, um, is there, here. Picture, please. I think it's okay for now. Picture, please. So this is the top here of a very faint dorsal process of C6, um, just for reference. And then the thinner needle, my RF needle, is on um, that ladder, outside of the lateral mass of that level. I'm going to have you oblique toward me by five degrees, please. Thank you. Yeah. That was, 15 is too much. Five, five to 10. We were at 10 previous. Yes, okay, so 15 total, yeah. I was five to 10 from where we found AP. Thank you. Okay, so um, what I'm doing is, as I described, picture please, um, rotate, obliquing um, that uh, five to 10 degree um, uh, measurement from an AP so that when I place my needle um, in a gun barrel view t targeting the medial branch, it's going to be able to just very slightly come around the corner to where that medial branch climbs. Um, and I'm gonna, just a minute. Picture please. Picture please. Picture please. Again. Picture. 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 So at this point, I'm just trying to get my needle in a gun barrel view and anchored into the, uh, the tissues just lateral to that facet. Picture. Picture. So I like that my needle picture is, um, I like that my needle is aiming toward the waist of that lateral mass that, as I had pointed out to you on the spine model. Um, it's not quite in a gun barrel view yet, um, so I'll continue to work on, on that picture. Okay, well, let's just take it as it is now um, because I like, the, I like the trajectory here um, and I am getting some depth. Um, so I'd like to see my lateral view now in order to uh, make sure I'm not moving too far ventral toward that neural foramen. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to um, point to the, uh, the fluoroscopic image now. Um, can, you, uh, can you see my, my pointer um, as I point toward the, the, uh, the C arm tower or not? Oh, no, we can't see it, Jen. What was that? We can't see it. Can you, yes or no? No. Okay. Um, we so can see the. Uh, you see the specimen. Specimen and the uh, needle. Okay. The specimen. Please. All right. So um, what I want to point out is that the the picture, the lamina are not aligned in this picture. Picture, please. 
So my pointer there, yeah. which is beneath um, the radio frequency needle, is um, pointing toward the lamina of either the right or the left side. I do not know which. And then picture here and up. And this is the other lamina. So in this is a nice demonstration of how once you move to a lateral position, um, the next goal of yours in order to get um, a, a safe view is to um, get these two lamina to overlap with one another so that you are approaching a true, um, a true lateral view. So what I'm going to ask my x-ray technologist to do, um, it's 50-50 here, is either is to tilt this direction or this direction, um, just a small degree. And if you could even do it in live, that would be ideal. So not this is wigwag. Mm -hmm. This this way is what I'm looking for. Okay, shot. So we can see that the lamina split farther apart. No, actually they came together. I apologize. A little bit further. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. So I think I hope everybody appreciated here that with that live rotation, it makes it even more clear. That picture, please. Uh, picture and down picture. So this is my lamina, and previously we had two um, um, trapezoid-shaped uh, lamina on our lateral view that were not overlapped, and now they are. We do not see the doubling of that posterior laminar line. The second thing that I'm going to pay attention to in this view is my facet joint. So I should be able to see through my facet joint in this picture. So here at the upper level um, picture here, I think this is C45, three, four, four, five. It's really nice. That, that's a very nice view through the facet joint. Um, in order to get, it may, according to um, the arthro arthropathic features of the joint, it may not always look that pretty. Um, but the way that we're going to see if we can improve on this is with a little bit of wigwag. And it needs to be a very small amount. And once again, it's like 50-50, right? You go one direction. If it doesn't improve, you go the other. Picture? So we got lucky. Um, what we saw here is that um, picture, please. Picture, please. Picture, please. So this, my marker is right over the facet joint, um, which is really in, it's wide open here. And then we also see the, I'm going to withdraw my needle a little bit, picture. We can also see that the posterior line of the lamina is overlapped really well as, as, as well. So this is, um, to my suspicion, I had advanced my needle more than I, I, I need um, when I was initially um, positioning it in my PA view. So what I'm going to do now, since I have a picture, a nice uh, lateral picture uh, image, is optimize this picture by placing my needle in the middle of the waist of the, um, the cervical lateral mass here, where the medial branch would be identified. So um, from here, so each of the locations of the cervical medial branches um, from C3 to C7 are going to be a little different. Um, in the upper cervical spine, the medial branch of the, um, uh, of the, um, that innervates the facet joint is a little bit higher, um, uh, near to the, the, that superior articular process. And as you move down toward the C5, C6, and C7 levels, um, the medial branch is going to be uh, nearer to the midpoint of that lateral mass. So for this particular person, specimen, picture please. I think it would be very reasonable picture to do my first lesion in this, in this position. And then um, I would do a second lesion, picture, picture, in a position like this. So these are at least one needle breadth difference um, in, in the positions of the lesions that I would deliver to the patient. Um, can we go back to AP and transfer that to the right? Thank you for doing that. So um, 
Um, yes, thank you. So I'm going back to AP as I told you I would in order to confirm that as I advanced my needle on lateral, it remained um, it, lateral to that, um, that, the waist of the facet joint. And so that I would be really pleased with. Um, you can also get a foraminal view and confirm in a foraminal view that the needle tip hasn't pass pointed into um, territory that is um, clearly not, not your intention. So um, the, I would say that the other, um, one of the other features of um, that Boston Scientific's equipment um, offers is a, a specialized needle called Sidekick. And I do use this needle, not in every instance, um, but I use it in the cervical spine, especially up at the, C, uh, the, the third occipital nerve level. The uh, Sidekick needle, um, do we have one? No? Okay. So. I'm going to show you um, on this over the specimen, if you would uh, picture it over the specimen. Um, okay. Well, um, so picture again. Uh, again. Where is the camera? Thank you for zooming in. So, as we all know. Um, with radiofrequency needles, um, there is a uh, aperture on the on the side of the needle here. So there's most radiofrequency needles have a bit of a flex on the end, and then they have this little aperture here. Um, excuse me, this aperture is is unique to the the sidekick needle. So. We usually have a stylet that is placed through the needle, um, and then that last portion, um, you can select between five and 10 millimeters of an active tip that is able to, to, get, to uh, facilitate the, the tissues becoming heated. Um, however, the, what's unique about um, a sidekick needle is that it has this um, secondary hole, and the hole allows for a stylet to be placed in such, a, in such a way that it will exit the side of that hole. And the result um, would be that, is that the, okay, perfect. We have one demonst to demonstrate. Down to the blue field, please. Okay, so um, in an ordinary, in any other typical um, radio frequency needle, the lesion that is created um, is going to be um, surround in kind of a football shape surrounding the active tip here. This is a 10 millimeter active tip. And the stylet is going to be what um, delivers the alternating current to produce the, the heated tissue effect. So a, st a sidekick needle um, is unique because it has this aperture on the side that allows for the stylet to exit um, in, um, in a, a forked pattern. And the result is that you get a, a lesion um, that surrounds both of these spaces. And the lesion will therefore be quite a lot larger. It approaches twice um, the volume of a lesion that would be produced by the single um, cannula alone. So this is useful in situations, in my opinion, when uh, you may want to deliver multiple ablations, such as in the third occipital nerve. The recommendation for ablating the third occipital nerve is that you are going to produce, uh, apply three or greater lesions because that nerve can span from the inferior articular process of C2 over the joint and to the area of the superior articular process of C3. So that's, that's some serious territory to cover that would need to be ablated in order to really you know, have a good likelihood of um, interfering with nerve um, function in that space. And by using a larger lesion size that the sidekick needle can, <clears throat> can provide, you um, are able to do that quicker. So I w am able to um, find success in my patients doing um, third occipital nerve ablations just using two lesions, one on the inferior articular process of C2 and another at the very top of the superior articular process of C3. Um, also for some variab variable anatomy, like um, the lateral branches of the, of the um, sac sacrum, the S1, 2, and 3 lateral branches, this is something to consider. Glenn, do we have time to talk about lumbar radiofrequency ablation? 
Oh, we talked about it a little bit yesterday. Uh, uh, for the uh, 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 problems of time, uh, we're going to have to have to transfer over to the lab stations now and okay. uh, get the uh, fellows to change into their scrubs quickly. Okay. But, but awesome. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful uh, demonstration, uh, Dr. Lee, and uh, and uh, displaying the uh, Boston Scientific uh, uh, hardware there.